the news of Annie Oakley's arrest took the country by storm. And rightfully so. I mean, she was America's original sweetheart. Little Miss Sure Shot, the diminutive darling of the Wild West show who performed in front of nobility and the common folk alike, who once personally entertained the Queen of England, now reduced to petty thievery on the dirty streets of the Windy City. Steals to secure cocaine, read the brazen headline printed in the August 11th, 1903 edition of the Chicago American, a copy that was quickly picked up and spread across the nation like wildfire. It was almost too much to believe, especially for a Mrs. Phoebe Ann Butler of Nutley, New Jersey. Her sharp eyes scanning the tell-all print with an astonished incredulousness that soon turned into a simmering rage. The article alleged that the great Annie Oakley stole the trousers, or britches as my dad likes to call them, from a quote-unquote Negro in order to obtain money in which to feed this lust for dope. It even quoted the famous lady herself, admitting that she had an uncontrollable appetite for that devil's nose candy, and pleading with the judge to have pity on her. A supplication that fell on deaf ears, as he not only fined the sharpshooter $45, but also threw her ass behind bars, saying that a good long stay in the clink might just do her some good. And if that's not enough, the write-up even went on to disparage Miss Oakley's diminished physical attributes, stating that despite being just 28 years of age, she appeared closer to 40 her once striking appearance completely ravaged by addiction. And by this point, Mrs. Butler of Nutley, New Jersey, loyal wife of Frank, had read enough. The next day, she boldly marched into the office of the Baltimore Sun lawyer in tow, demanding a retraction. A demand, by the way, that was readily met, seeing as to how Mrs. Butler had quite the convincing story. You see, she knew for a fact that Annie Oakley weren't no dope fiend. And she knew Annie wasn't in Chicago at the time of this alleged crime, nor arrest. Matter of fact, she knew exactly where the famous trick shot was on the night in question. She was right there in Baltimore, attending a meet and greet at a country club. Mrs. Butler knew all this because, well, if you haven't already figured it out, she was the real Annie Oakley. The whole damn thing had been a big mix-up, coupled with shoddy reporting. And as you can imagine, Annie did not appreciate it a whole hell of a lot. And while it's true, a lady of the night had been arrested in Chicago, and she had given her name as Annie a-N-Y, Oakley. That's about as far as the likeness went. The accused was actually a burlesque dancer by the name of Maude Fontanella. And while she may have been a haggard peering 27-year-old, the real Annie was already 43. And she was spoiling for a fight. But let's just back up a bit. I feel like most people, even those with just a passing familiarity with history, know who Annie Oakley was, or at least her name. Maybe you've even seen a picture of her aiming a rifle over her shoulder backwards while peering into a mirror. Or maybe you've seen the photo featuring the young lady with long, wavy brown hair spilling out of a cowboy hat as she poses with a proud Native American, both of them holding their weapons at the ready. And probably you also know that she toured with Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show. But what you may not be aware of is the fact that Annie Oakley herself was not a participant in the actual, air quotes, Wild West. She was no gunfighter or bandit or army scout or anything like that. She didn't roam the prairie nor walk the dusty streets of wild cow towns. Hell, she didn't even travel west of the Mississippi until well into her career. She was simply an entertainer, albeit an extremely talented entertainer. Born Phoebe Ann Moses in Ohio, the just five foot tall pocket sized Oakley would become a member of the Wild West Show in 1885 at the age of 25. And the Wild West show, of course, was sort of an open-air variety production depicting and oftentimes featuring real-life figures from the Old West. Imagine an arena, and instead of monster trucks or football players, you've got mounted warriors and old army scouts, and they're putting on mock battles. And you also had exhibition acts like Oakley showing off her sharpshooting abilities. This was a job that soon found her touring not only all over the United States, but across the pond to Europe as well, showing off her prowess with a firearm to UK's Queen Victoria. Italy's King Umberto, the German Kaiser Wilhelm II, and even the President of France, whose name I'm not able to pronounce. But let's face it, it's France, so who the fuck cares, right? Considered by some to be the first female superstar from the United States, Annie Oakley was known and loved by all. And to be perfectly honest, she's never even gotten close to being interesting to me. Sorry, I know, call it sexism, call it whatever you want. I like the gritty history, the desperate fights and the rank outlaws, the struggle for survival in an untamed savage wilderness. Not so much trick shots. Don't get me wrong, I am very impressed by Annie Oakley's talent. Make no mistake about it. I'm being dead serious. Her expertise is truly legendary. 
We're talking about a lady who could hit targets while standing on the back of a galloping horse. She could shoot the flame out of a candle, the cigarette from between a man's lips, hit the middle of an ace of spades over her shoulder, and was even known to take a run and jump off a table and blast four balls out of the sky before any of them hit the ground. There's no two ways about it. That's some spectacular shooting and literal ball busting. But still, though, I mean, this is an Old West podcast. And as such, I've tried to limit the content to people and events from the actual Old West era. And while Annie Oakley was technically of that era, she was about as much of a Wild West figure as, say, Tom Mix, you know, that early cowboy actor. Sure, they could both sit the saddle and they both knew how to shoot guns. And they both knew real Wild West figures. They mingled in the same circles. It's not like I'm the reincarnation of Wild Bill Hickok either. I just want to make that clear. This is not me saying anything bad about the woman. All of this is simply my long-winded way of saying that Annie Oakley has never picked my basic bitch curiosity. Until now, let's just say there are certain aspects of Mrs. Oakley's life that I was unaware of. Hat tip to the listener whose name I've misplaced, my apologies, who clued me in on this a while back. If there's one thing I really like more than anything, it's a good underdog story. Someone overcoming insurmountable odds or fighting back against the powers that be. Here's the thing, Annie Oakley may not have been no gunfighter or mountain man or what have you, but she had every bit of the same qualities, including the battle scars. Oh yes, you're damn right, she had scars. Some were visible, and others, not so much, at least not to the naked eye. But these scars had her as battle-ready as any warrior who ever strung a bow. And when that Chicago paper decided to run that erroneous article and drag her good name through the mud... They unwittingly awoke a giant of a woman, a scrappy little fighter who wasn't going to take this beating, lying down. All right, enough with the preamble. Powder up that honey pot and grab your rifle. My name's Josh, and this is the Wild West Extravaganza. Yeah! Ah, William Randolph Hearst. A true son of a bitch if there ever was one. If you're not familiar with the man, he was the son of George Hearst, the infamous gold tycoon portrayed on HBO's Deadwood. And while that was a highly fictionalized likeness by the great Gerald McRaney, certain aspects were accurate. The real George Hearst did take control of the Homestake mine and the real Deadwood, and he did enlarge his very real holdings by very real nefarious means, up to and including beaten journalists, having the witnesses disappeared, and just out and out murdering those who refused to sell out to him. And while his son, William Randolph, never sank to such low extremes as outright murder, at least not that I'm aware of, he wasn't afraid of inciting violence and destroying reputations, nor did he shy away from butchering the truth. Born with a silver spoon planted firmly up his arrogant little ass, the younger Hearst initially entered into the world of publishing after his daddy gifted him the San Francisco Examiner. Not long after, little Willie would move back east and acquire another newspaper, the New York Journal which he used to spur on a violent circulation war with a rival paper, one that was headed by Joseph Pulitzer. Yes, that Pulitzer. Check out the podcast Obscure History for a good rundown on that little fracas. Link in this episode's show notes. Really interesting stuff that had me wanting to watch the gangs in New York for about the millionth time. It was also around this same period that Hearst would perfect the art of yellow journalism. The act of reporting with little to no facts and relying on eye-catching headlines and sensationalism just to sell copy. (laughs) Huh, sound familiar? As such, it should come as no surprise that it was his Chicago paper who was the first to publish the false story of Annie Oakley's arrest. Everybody else just kind of ran with it. Shit, it was even picked up by the Associated Press. At his peak, William Randolph Hearst would control over 30 newspapers across the country as well as magazines, bringing his version of the news to millions of readers, as well as controlling the narrative. In other words, he was able to promote his own views and opinions and basically drown out any dissenting voices. Oh yeah, now it's really starting to sound familiar. That's where the idea of him causing the entire Spanish-American war comes into play. And while it's true that he did very much over-exaggerate claims of Spanish atrocities, thus ensuring that everybody and their mama had their panties in a bunch, Historians do disagree that he alone was responsible for starting the war. But did he contribute? Abso-fucking-lutely. It was a short conflict, yes, but nearly 2,500 Americans lost their lives, while his pampered ass sat in the comfy confines of his office, enjoying a life of luxury. But that's how it works, huh? You know, the ones that start the wars are never the ones that actually do any of the fighting. But I digress. 
And before I smear Hearst too much, it was he who helped bring us the first works of Mark Twain and Jack London, so guess he wasn't a total loss. Look, you know me, I'm not real big on judging historical figures by our modern day standards. Some I talk about all the time. But some douchebaggery is just universally douchebaggy. As far as I'm concerned, is Hearst exaggerated headlines and total disregard for legitimate, well-researched news, as well as corruption, that will forever remain his legacy. If he thought he could sell a story or somehow line his already very full pockets, it didn't matter if it was true or not, it didn't matter who it hurt, who it would destroy, he'd have it printed, and once he printed it, he would defend it. So just to kind of sum it up to make it a little bit more clear, by the time Hearst's Chicago paper ran with that article on Annie, he was already the most powerful media mogul this country had ever known was partly responsible for getting the country into a war, served in Congress, and was already eyeing a run at the White House. And when all those papers began retracting and posting corrections, Hearst decided to double down, even to the point of hiring investigators to dig up dirt on the real Annie Oakley to further smear her name. Pinkertons they were. Not a big fan of them either. This is almost the olden days equivalent of Uh, you know, imagine if Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates both teamed up and used the power of Google and Facebook to trash your name. And then they used their connections to have the feds ruin your reputation even further. Who could stand up to such a force? The media blitz alone would be almost unbearable. To be blunt, a tiny little lady like Annie Oakley didn't stand a snowball's chance in hell. At least you wouldn't think so, right? But as I alluded to earlier, Annie was a fighter. And what she lacked in physical stature, she more than made up for with grit. The exact type that William Shakespeare once wrote of when he penned the verse, and though she be but little, she is fierce. Oakley wasn't intimidated by Hearst and his massive media empire, his power and connections and money. She knew she was in the right. And as the great Davy Crockett once supposedly said, make sure you're in the right and then go on ahead. The old badass. No, he didn't say that last part. Uh, And that is just what Andy did. She went on ahead with it, with her badass. Not with a gun, though, but with lawyers. Lawyers who sued the hell out of William Randolph Hearst, his papers, and all the other papers who drug her name through the mud. Even those who retracted the very next day didn't matter. She wanted vindication, wanted her name cleared, and she wanted it cleared publicly, the same way it got tarnished. Now, many of these papers were owned by Hearst, though. And in the end, after years of litigation, despite continuous unsuccessful attempts to dig up dirt on Oakley, despite intimidation and threats and everything else, Annie won. She won 54 out of 55 cases, taking the old bastard for $27,500. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's almost 800000 in today's money. But that's still not really all that much, especially considering his net worth, adjusted for inflation, would be almost around $30 billion. And especially considering how in the end, Annie came out at a loss, spending all of her money and some of her own on all them lawyers it took to clear her name. But I guess it wasn't really about money. You know, not for her and not for hers. Nothing fighting for ever really is. You know, I'll never forget something my father once told me. He said, son, get your head out of your ass. But there's also something else he once said that's always stuck with me. He told me that in this world, they can take everything from you. Everything. Except for your self-respect. Nobody can take that from you. You have to give it up yourself. Annie Oakley didn't care that she lost all that money. Didn't care about the threats. Didn't care about going toe-to-toe with one of the most powerful men in the country. Like I said, she had grit. And she did win. And when it was all over, everybody knew the truth about America's sweetheart. Her reputation remained intact, as did her self-respect. And she could continue to hold her head up high. It's a pretty cool story, right? Kind of a David versus Goliath, good always triumphs kind of tale. There's a little bit more to it, though. Now, when I initially read about this about her taking Hearst to court and actually winning, I thought, all right, that's pretty cool. Tough lady. Once again, call me sexist or old-fashioned, but my next immediate thought was that this was probably because of Andy spending all that time with the Wild West show, you know, rubbing shoulders with them genuine tough guys, Bill Cody and Sitting Bull and all of them. Maybe those guys taught her a little bit about standing up for herself. Boy, was I wrong. Truth is, she might could have taught them a thing or two about standing up. You see, Annie Oakley had a fire inside of her that was all her own. There no man that gave Annie that inner strength, that fight. It was all her, forged from a childhood of trauma. And this next part, to me at least, makes her story all that more compelling. And like I said at the very beginning, Annie's given name was Phoebe Ann Moses, born in Ohio in 1860. 
and she was the sixth of nine children born to a dirt-poor Quaker family. Unfortunately, two of her siblings wouldn't make it to adulthood, making Annie the fifth out of seven. Times were hard, and they only got harder when Annie's father died when she was just five years old. Came down with hypothermia after getting stuck in a damn blizzard, and by the time he got home, it was just too late. The widow Moses married again, but that husband passed away as well, leaving the family in dire straits. Things got so bad that when Annie's older sister died of tuberculosis, her mother was forced to sell the family milk cow just to see her get buried. With all these kids to feed and not wanting to see them all starve, Annie's mother made a difficult decision. They placed the then nine-year-old Oakley into the Drake County Infirmary, also known as a poorhouse. It was the kind of place that was supposedly there to take care of the destitute, orphans and the mentally ill and the elderly. And later on, Annie was sent to live with different families. And this experience, or experiences, turned out to be a pure hell for the young girl. Over the next two years, she was beaten, locked in closets, used as slave labor, and, according to at least one source, likely sexually abused. One horrific incident that Annie later outlined included her being placed outside in the snow after making the tragic mistake of falling asleep while darning. And she was stuck out there without even so much as shoes or a coat to keep her warm. I got down on my little knees, looked towards God's clear sky, and I tried to pray, Oakley later said of the ordeal, but my lips were frozen stiff. Still, though, Annie refused to let this destroy her. That inner fighter was rising up, and at the age of 11, she escaped this prison, returned home, and took up her dearly departed daddy's old rifle, went back to that poor house and waited patiently in the shadows till the sun went down. Creeping softly on steady feet, the 11-year-old Annie then snuck into the house. One by one, shot down every son of a bitch who ever tortured her. Not only them, but their wives and their dogs. And then she burnt the damn building to the godforsaken ground it stood on. To this day, the charred remains of the Drake County Infirmary remain untouched. A simple limestone marker in its place that reads, Monsters once dwelled here. Tourists often visit and spit over the ashes. And no, that's not true. Damn it. Wish it was, though. Would have been a lot cooler, but this ain't Hollywood. This is real life. Now, in reality, Annie did escape at the age of 11, and she did take up her father's gun. But rather than revenge, she used it to provide food for her struggling mother and siblings. And not only did that rifle help feed their bellies, but it also turned out to be her ticket to a better life. Turns out Annie didn't miss very often when she aimed a rifle. She took down so much game that she was able to sell the extra meat and all the hides for money. So much money that she was able to pay off her mother's mortgage at the age of 15. And that's some fancy shooting. I don't think I paid anything off at the age of 15. Uh, shit, I could barely pay attention at that age. News soon spread of the little firebrand's prowess with a rifle, and at the urging of others, Annie began entering shooting contests. And winning. Being outgrown men. That's how she met her husband, Frank. She outshot him in a competition. And the rest is history, you know, she became a legend in a man's world, dominating them at a game that they thought was all their own. So yeah, Annie learned how to rise above adversity long before she ever heard of William Randolph Hearst. And when he picked a fight with her, he wasn't picking a fight with some shy, cowering little wallflower. She already had a backbone of iron. She learned that you couldn't give up no matter how bad things were getting, you had to keep on fighting. Now, despite this rise from the pits of abuse and poverty, you'd think that maybe Annie's past experiences would have soured her to life. Maybe caused her to become bitter or mean. And nothing could be further from the truth. According to pretty much everybody, Annie was always the lady. Always nice, always kind. Always carried herself with a certain dignity. Soft-spoken, courteous, dignified. She herself even once said that to be considered a lady was always her highest ambition. The late actor Will Rogers once recalled, quote, I had heard cowboys who had traveled with the Buffalo Bill show speak of her in almost reverence. They loved her. She was a marvelous woman, kindest hearted, most thoughtful, a wonderful Christian woman, end quote. Even in the courtroom when Hearst attorneys and investigators continued to smear her name, she never lost her composure. They even accused her of showing a little bit of skin on stage. Total lie because Annie specifically designed her outfits to cover her entire body, even her damn ankles. Another lawyer, knowing that she had pretty much zero formal schooling, asked her what she thought of education. Annie's reply, well, education's a very good thing when backed by common sense. A very bad thing in the head of a cheap lawyer. Don't get it twisted, though. 
This carefully cultivated reputation as a lady didn't mean that Annie kowtowed to no men. I mean, obviously, right? She sure as hell stood up to Hearst. But she was also a big proponent of women's rights, like equal pay and the right of a woman to not only be able to carry a firearm to protect herself, but to know how to use it. And yes, Annie taught a ton of women how to shoot over the years. Even how to properly conceal a revolver that is ready for use in the folds of their umbrellas. Arguing that in an assault situation, they would not have the time to retrieve it from their purse. Annie would continue to shoot for the rest of her life, even offering to train up a company of female sharpshooters for World War I. And even still, after a horrible car accident in 1922, they caused her to wear a brace on her leg. A brace that she refused to let prevent her from breaking even more shooting records. We're talking about a woman in her mid-60s at this point, with a bum leg, breaking records. Sadly, her health would decline rapidly, thanks to anemia. And Little Miss Sure Shot would pass away in November of 1926, at the age of 66. Her beloved and heartbroken husband Frank would follow her to the other side just 18 days later. Annie's legacy lives on as she continues to be an inspiration. I mean, there's just not a whole lot of bad things to say about the woman, and that in and of itself is an anomaly. Ironically, she wasn't too big on women having the right to vote, so she does get a little bit of not-so-kind words from feminists every now and then. According to Annie, her fear was not enough quote-unquote good women would vote. <laughs> and, well, while I do support everybody's right to vote, I kind of agree with the sentiment here. Not as far as women are concerned, but people in general. I'm not one of those, oh, everybody should vote kind of people. No, stay your ass at home. Chances are I hate the way you vote. All right, but that ain't got nothing to do with nothing. Now, I know this episode is a little bit of a deviation from what we usually talk about, but I thought it embodied the ideals of the Wild West. That same grit and determination that one would need to survive out West is the same that Annie deployed to help fight her way out of a hell of a rough childhood and to rise out of the mire and excel in a man's world and to not take no shit from no one, even someone as powerful as William Randolph Hearst. That terrible piece almost killed me. Annie said of the original article, besmirching her name, The only thing that kept me alive was the desire to purge my character. And purge it she did, and then some. Now, Annie never publicly named her childhood abusers, unfortunately, opting instead to refer to them as wolves. As far as Hearst goes, it was sadly a win-win situation. The more he fought back against Annie's lawsuits, the more sensational headlines he could then print, ensuring that he'd sell even more papers. And that's kind of the third theme to this whole tale, really. And proof that history continues to repeat itself. We see the same tactics even today. Social media, news organizations, they're all in it to win it. And by win it, I mean make that money. If it bleeds, it leads. And the more sensational the headline, no matter how true it may or may not be, the more likely people will click on it or stop to watch it or whatever. It's just a perpetual outrage machine. But okay, enough about all that. I'll leave you with one last quote from Annie Oakley. When asked later in life if she had ever actually used cocaine, she replied, quote, I'll just say this. I never snorted it to get high. That's what you're implying. I just like the way it smelled. End quote. And no, damn it, she never said that. <sighs> I wish she had, though. But she did not. No, that was the great Ray Wiley Hubbard in his song Conversation with the Devil. Here's an actual quote from Annie that I think sums up her tenacity. I ain't afraid to love a man, but I ain't afraid to shoot one either. All right, and that's about all I've got on Annie Oakley. If you're looking for a more of a deep dive into her, along with a lot of laughs, check out episode 219 of Time Suck. It's a couple hours long, goes into more detail, and it's a hell of a lot more entertaining than this podcast. Speaking of Time Suck, not sure if I've ever mentioned it, but Time Suck was the podcast that inspired the Wild West extravaganza. If you go back and listen to my early episodes, you can definitely tell the influence there. A little bit too much. Uh, I actually got a one-star review on that a long time ago, well over a year ago. And to be honest, it really kind of bothered me. Not because it was a one-star review, but because it was true. It was something along the lines of, somebody should tell this guy he's not Dan Cummins. He's clearly a fan. Guilty. Definitely a fan. Love Time Suck. Seen the man do stand-up, it was hilarious. Shook his hand, very nice guy. But yeah, there was way too much of an influence of Time Suck on the early episodes back when this was Bloody Beaver podcast. Just one of the many reasons why I hate when people go back and listen to my really early stuff. 
it just seems, I don't know, I'm trying to be something I'm not. And hopefully now coming into my own voice a little bit. So yeah, I just want to mention that and get it off my chest. It's been gnawing at me for a while now. All right. On my last episode, I posed a question. What actor do you think should portray Kit Carson if they ever get around to making a movie of the man? And a lot of y'all chimed in, so I'll just go over a few of the submissions. Sean Penn was one of them. Great actor, but I'm not sure he's the perfect fit for Carson. He's also kind of old AF, you know? Like I said, though, great actor. If you've never seen a movie called Mystic River, definitely check that out. It's one of my favorites of his. Up next, we've got Kim Coates. You may remember him from Sons of Anarchy and Open Range. Another good actor. And pretty much everybody I'm about to mention is a great actor, so I think I can stop saying that. I do feel like, as far as Kim Coates is concerned, he's more fit to play kind of the same guy he played in Sons of Anarchy and Open Range. A wisecracking bad guy. Not sure if that's the right angle for Kit Carson. Tim Blake Nelson was nominated more than once. I had several people say Tim Blake Nelson. I even kind of considered him as well. While I'm sure he'd be great in the role, I'm not sure he's perfect. Jared Pilecki, someone uh, mentioned. I had no idea who this guy was. I had to look him up, and I'm still not sure I've actually seen anything with him in it. Looking at pictures of him, physically speaking, I could see him playing Kit, but ability-wise, I have no idea. Billy Bob Thornton, too damn old. I'll say this much, though. If Billy Bob wants to direct the movie, I'm 100% on board with that. Look at what he did with Sling Blade and All the Pretty Horses. Just a quick little anecdotal story about Thornton. I worked with a guy one time that was an extra on the Alamo, played one of the Mexican soldiers. And he was telling me that while some of the other big name actors that I'm not going to name here were very cold to everybody on set, just real aloof and kind of pretty much assholes. Billy Bob was the exact opposite. Always treated everybody the same, always friendly. One day he even took all the extras out to a titty bar. I don't know if that's true or not, but I've been a fan of the guy ever since I heard it. Okay. Up next is Jesse Plemons. I'm torn on this one. I think this guy is really going to be someone to watch in the years to come. I was just giving Hostiles another view in the other day and thinking about how good he was. Not going to lie, though. Dude's face throws me off a little bit. I always kind of think he looks like Matt Damon's little brother. You know, if Matt Damon had a little brother that still lived at home with his parents and worked part-time at a plumbing supply company. Is that fair? No. But that's just the way it is. Okay, finally... Here is my nomination on who should play Kit Carson. Jeremy Renner. Hear me out. I think he's got the look down and he can play that western shit when he wants to. His character in Wind River would be pretty close to perfect for Kit Carson, in my opinion. And according to Google, he's only 51 years old, which is like 30 in Hollywood years. Mostly thanks to all that baby blood and adrenochrome they're always taking. Like I said, though, that's just my opinion. I had fun considering all these options, so I'm thinking this might just be a reoccurring segment on this podcast, which brings us back to Annie Oakley. Who should play Annie Oakley in a movie? What do you think? Hit me up at wildwestextra at gmail.com and let me know. Or head on over to wildwestextra.com and hit that contact button. A few episodes ago, I did a book giveaway, and I can't remember if I ever announced the winner, but I shall do so now. It was Bill from Patreon. So thank you for the support, Bill. And thank you to all my other patrons as well. Brandon, Antonio, Ryan, Asher, Reggae, Eric, Timothy, Creature, Nick, David, Skinny Dick, Keith, the always enchanting man of enchantment, Kenneth, Tony, Jamie, Alphonse, Everett, Momo, Pat, and Michael. Speaking of Michael, if you're not listening to his podcast, Texas History Lessons, well, I can't help you. Seriously, give it a listen. Link in this episode's show notes. Dude's really been hitting it out of the park lately with his episodes on New Spain. It's legacy on what we now know as Texas and the power of ideas and how those ideas shape our history. Really good stuff. Special shout outs this episode go to Bobby Sandoval, Michael Livingston, Jason, Kevin Severe, Rogelio, Matt Kobe, Ralph Teller, Tim Veal, them bad boys and girls over there at the Outlaw Saloon in San Antonio, Texas. I guarantee you they know a thing or two about Ray Wiley Hubbard. Danny Simmons, Middle American, Krista Burke. Tim S., Raymond P., Plymouth, W., Matthew Geisel, Doug Murray, the ever-engaging Art Lucero, Omar Reyes, and Tom Detroit. Y'all are fucking amazing. Glad you're listening. I sincerely hope you continue to listen to my nonsense. And if you like what you hear, please share this podcast. And if you want to donate to the cause, feel free to buy me a coffee. 
at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Wild West. All right. I think that's about all I've got this week. Once again, thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed this girl power episode. And I hope that you, like Annie, will fight through tough times and stand up for yourself whenever you are in the right. And stop watching the damn news. Till next time, adios. Let's face it, it's France, so who the fuck cares, right?